Good afternoon, viewers. So, uh, I need to give you a bit of context. Somebody turn to your neighbor and tell them God is doing a new thing. So, story, story. Here's the thing. Oh, and you can have your seats. I'll, I'll, make, you, I'll make you get up later. So, don't worry. <laughs> so, I just want to honor um, the father of the house, the shepherd, the overseer of this ministry, Pastor Muredi Wanzao. Give it up for him. And here's why. He really does lead by example. So as God has been doing a new thing, and we've been starting to perceive it, uh, God really does download the new thing on our leader. So one of the things that God is doing that is new within the movement that hasn't happened over very many years is that God is beginning to birth songs in the movement. So there's a song that we've been singing all through the gathering. Uh, what song is that? All in. all in. That was written by our very own pastor, Buredi Wanjao. That one came straight from heaven to the pastor and then to our campuses. So as we are led, we, we follow. So again, he rounded up a bunch of us from the movement and we began the process of writing some new songs. Mabuno. So what we're going to do today is introduce or rather demo a new song for you that has never been heard. <laughs> and here's the thing, it's so new we don't even have the name of the song. So we'll go through the lyrics, you'll learn it, and then we'll even do this process where we'll ask you what do you think the song should be called. But uh, I want to spend, I want to send special shout outs, some in absentia, some here for the people who actually wrote this song. Pastor Florian from Burundi, I know you might be watching, watch party, give it up for him. Pastor Yemi from Mashariki, who's now in Nigeria, give it up for him. Hailing all the way from the Pearl of Africa, Kampala, give it up for Pastor Osai, who also wrote this song. And then there were a bunch of us who critiqued it and took it to studio and whatnot. So, is it okay if I teach you this new song? Is it okay if we, we do it together and see how it works for us? All right, uh, Lucas, give me the key, please. Thank you. Uh, lyrics, are you ready so that we can have some assistance? We're going to do the chorus. So, I, I sing a line and you sing after me. Uh, oh, and Candy and Sharon are going to help. Give it up for them. <laughs> So it goes, I will sing his praises. You say, I will sing his praises. Celebrate his goodness. You sing, Celebrate his goodness. Make his name so famous. You got it? Make his name so Last part. For he's my God. You sing for. for he's my God. Let's put it all together. I will sing. I will sing his praises. Celebrate. Celebrate his goodness. Make his name. Make his name so famous. For he is my God. Give yourselves a round of applause. You sound so beautiful. I already love this song a lot more when I hear you guys singing it. So is it okay if now we demo the song for you the way we have done it so far? We don't even have all the instrument arrangements figured out, but as far as we can come, this is an incomplete testimony, and you're part of the testimony. Hallelujah. And if it starts to resonate with you, just pop up and start to dance and sing along with us, okay? Sound, are we ready? All right, let's do this. Put your hands together. Here we go. I will sing his praises. Stand up, bring his goodness. Make his name so famous. For he is my God. Verse 1. I was broken, dismayed. 
and alone doors were shut and nowhere to turn. Shattered dreams and hopelessness, and then you came to my rescue. You know this part, sing with me. I will sing his praises. Celebrate! Celebrate his goodness. Make his name. Make his name so famous. For he is my God. We can wave side to side as we sing. I will sing his praises. Celebrate his goodness. Make his name so famous. For he is my God. Verse 2. No greater love has no man. Mavuno campus near you. Now all of you have become worship leaders. So when the song goes into your campus, guess what? You're the ones who are going to be teaching it to your congregation. And this isn't even a prophecy. There will be many more songs that will come as a result of what God is doing in our family. Hallelujah. Yeah. Now I have the privilege of introducing Mavuno Church's lead songwriter. Mavuno Church's father of the house. Mavuno Church's shepherd. A man who I have had the privilege of knowing since the year 2005 when I was a teenager. Give it up for our general. The one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend. Pastor Muredi Wan Jiao. Come on, celebrate him. Thank you so much. Amen. Can we just appreciate the worship team one more time? Woo! <laughs> so exciting. It's nice to hear this song, huh? Eh? Yeah, it is. Please have your seats. We had an amazing, um, just re a small gathering, and we wrote a few songs with the team. And it's so much fun when they finally have come out of the kitchen. We've been waiting for Riga and his team uh, to finish that. Um, I challenge the Mavuno worship teams to write a hundred songs this year. Yeah. And uh, there was one that was written in Mashariki, those, those dancers. We need to record that one also. We need that one recorded very soon. Uh, I just feel like the Lord is releasing creativity 
And when the Lord starts to move, one of the things that starts to happen is songs start to arise. Uh, it's just every revival has songs with it. And so I believe that God is just leading us into this season when people begin uh, to be creatively provoked for the sake of the kingdom. Amen. Yeah, I love, I love the team. God has given us such talented musicians, by the way. Uh, every campus in Mavuno Church. I mean, that's one of the things I enjoy about visiting Mavuno is just to experience the different gifts of their ma- And I'm serious. Every single campus I've gone to just has some amazing, amazing musicians. And so I can't wait to see what God does as we begin to collaborate and do big things together. Uh, I noticed something exciting. Uh, I, I saw that Hill City are organizing on February the 18th a singles mingle. Hey, come on, Hill City. And so, Pastor, P- Pastor James, is that singles mingle open to people outside Hill City? Yes, very open. More than open, huh? So, you've heard, huh? So, you can export yourself here. Uh, be part of Hill City for February the 18th. What time was it again? Is that poster up there? Okay, just put up the poster. One of my convictions, as you're raising up an army, we have to get young men in this church to marry young women in this church. Yeah. I believe in zero grazing, by the way. Yeah. Here, here's a good couple. Just stand up. Let's introduce a new, one of these newest couple in Mavuno Church. Yes. That's uh, Henry Onen and Purity. Uh, Henry was from Avuno, is from Avuno Kampala. Purity was from, was from Avuno South. And we exported our finest, our finest. And they met at the gathering. Which gathering was that? Last year, February. At a time like this, as people were praying, some with their eyes closed, there were some who were watching and praying. <laughs> so congratulations guys we're so happy you know the thing is if you bring up a soldier and then they get sniped by some, some some other they get married some other funny place you don't know where you're sending them and they might be a good they might go to a good place but then you find that you've they've got a soldier's heart and they've gone into a place where they're not being used as a soldier so i want to see all the young ladies in this church married to fine gentlemen who are also soldiers who are also soldiers yes so, so as you've heard, a lot can happen in a year. Yeah, a lot can happen in a year. We are ready. I was even at their wedding. We are ready. When they told me they met in a gathering, I said, that one I'm coming. <laughs> so uh, all jokes aside, uh, that event that Pastor James is putting together is an important one. And I'm hoping we can put more of those together because I really do believe it's important. I'm hoping the worship team can even write a few love songs in that mix. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We need, to, we need to understand that love came from God. This is what the kingdom is. The kingdom means that God is in charge of everything, even romance. Hey, some guys grew up in churches where they're like, hey. <laughs> yes, he is. Wow. So I can't wait for that event. Please sign up um, and uh, come in numbers and also other campuses. Just challenge you. Put together events like these. Let's make sure people connect. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good thing to find a spouse, by the way. Yeah. yeah, in fact, it's a good thing to find a spouse when you're young. The best time was yesterday. The second best time is today, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you're in your 20s and thinking, ah, one day when I'm 40, when I'm 30, Shindwe, let me just tell you, your, your life will just get more complicated. Huh? If you have options now, take the option. By the way, if you find a good spouse here, just take her. Uh, it's Oh, Pastor Susie. Oh, that's another one from here. Yes. This one, just stand up and introduce that, that couple. They're about to get married. One is Mavuno, one is Mavuno Blantyre, and the other one is Mavuno Light, Downtown. Blantyre and Downtown. So it's happening, it's happening, guys. International. Huh? <laughs> Zero grazing at work. It works. And they look very happy, by the way. Yeah, yeah. They, <laughs> those ones met in internship, by the way. So, as Pastor James was saying, everybody should do discovery. There's a, there's other good reasons. Yeah, if you can discover many people, uh, including the one you should marry. So, I want to just uh, get us a bit deeper. Somebody say deeper. Yeah, we, like I said, when I got up today, I asked God, how do I share? How do I close? What do we do? God had already done such powerful things the last three days. And I was like, God, I almost feel like the gathering is over. What do you want me to talk about? 
And God told me, just go higher. Take people higher. Let them op open, help them to understand the big picture. And you know, if you're like me, I don't know, there's some of you who are like me, where the big picture is all I need. I, I, the, the how is good and the what is good, but if you can help me understand the why, then that sorts out things for me. And I felt like that's what the Holy Spirit wanted me to do, is just sort out the why. Get people to understand the bigger picture of God's heart. Understand your father's heart. Because then you understand why he's asking you to do things that might be uncomfortable or even hard. So we talked about the kingdom. And we talked about the fact that the ultimate role of the church is through discipleship to restore the nations of the world to their rightful ruler. And we talked about the fact that because people don't understand this, they end up, we end up being in a place where we've got half our feet in our own agenda and half the other foot in, our, in God's agenda, and we become ineffective Christians. There's nothing, if the devil can't keep you from being saved, then the next thing he'll do is make you a church Christian. Yeah, just that person who's saved comes to church, goes to Sunday, takes your kids to Sunday school, then go to the office, and that's how your life is. Not understanding that you are created for dominion. You're created to rule. You're created to be a king and a queen and to rule over this nation representing the rightful king. Uh, you're his ambassador, your royalty. And so I want to talk a bit of you about some of the implications of that. Now, the first is that there's something that I call kingdom stewardship. Kingdom stewardship. Psalm 115 verse 16 says, The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to who? Man. To man, man and woman. The earth is ours. Heavens are his, but he's delegated. As a king, he's decided who has the right to rule over the, the domain. Remember Psalm 24 already had told us the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. But now in Psalm 115 verse 16, he tells us even though it is his, he has given it to man. So we, he's given us not as an ownership, but as a, as a stewardship. It's something we are running for the sake of the king. There's one rightful king, and everything, every rule and dominion we extend on this earth is on his behalf. Believers often talk about going to heaven when they die, but you know, it's interesting that even though that is true, God has made an arrangement to make sure that when you get saved, you don't stay in heaven. And there's a reason for that. Because if we stayed in heaven, God's word would fail. Because God has plainly stated that we are created to rule the earth. So if you got saved and you are transported straight to heaven, God's plan for this world would not work. Because he needs people who are rulers over the earth on his behalf, who take back territory that the devil has stolen. The reason the Son of God appeared was to crush, destroy the, uh, the devil's work. And that's why he has left us here to take responsibility and authority on his behalf. And that's why he has made arrangements to ensure that believers who die now, that they will return with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18, it talks about that. It talks about Christ coming back. It talks about don't be fooled, that, that, that we don't want you to be uninformed about those who fall asleep. Is it there? Okay. Brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. So that you don't grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Maybe this is a word for somebody who lost somebody. And maybe you've been grieving like those who have no hope. Let me just put this. It's not in my notes. But you know it's possible to open a doorway to the enemy through how you grieve. Grieving is natural. And as Christians, we must grieve. We need to be real. But sometimes we mourn like those who have no hope. We cry like... Who am I now? What will I do? Who will I become? And we cry. This is how people in our culture cry. But we cry like them. And what are you saying to your father? You're saying, I have no father now. I have no husband now. I'm hopeless. I'm finished. Now, it's possible sometimes in your grief where you do something that is just, it's understandable. But it's very possible to get yourself to a place where you actually start opening a door to the other kingdom. And he says, yes, we grieve, but we don't grieve like people who have no hope. And he says uh, in verse 14, For we believe, this is why we grieve with hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. So we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. You know, sometimes the picture you have is Jesus coming back to earth, 
taking us away so we can join the ones in heaven. But what is he telling us there? That the ones who have died will come back. Okay, I know some of you are looking at it because you never read this in scripture. I'd never read this in scripture. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Let's keep going. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. So it basically means that, yes, God will come with those who have fallen asleep. And basically, what will happen is that he will come back with them. Why? Because a new heaven and a new earth. And what happens is God has been using this heaven and earth, this earth that we're on right now to train us so that we can rule and reign with him in eternity. Amen. But it's training. Wow. You're training. Nothing is wasted right now. Some of you are in a toxic office space and you're wondering, how do I survive? This place is so harsh. Does God love me? Why would he put me in a place like this? Let me tell you something. You've been put there because you're a soldier to subdue a hostile environment and bring it under the control of the king. So that you're able to say, may your kingdom come, may your will be done in my office as it is in heaven. And you're supposed to bring the force of God. We're going to talk about that, how, how you do that in a second. But you, your job, when you're there, is so that by the time you finish, you're able to say, it is finished. Amen. Just like Jesus, I'm done. I worked in that corporate, I finished, and it is finished. In fact, the work that I was supposed to do there, I'm done now. I don't cling to my job as if it's my source. No, 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 no. I was put there for a reason. And when I'm done, the master will tell me and I will leave without even a second glance. So the thing about it is God's intention is that we have dominion on earth. That means we are managers, we are supervisors, we are rulers, we are governors, we are leaders, we are stewards on this planet. And this is our responsibility. What happens on earth is our responsibility. God will hold us accountable for our stewardship. That's why I said he will hold you accountable for your paycheck. He will hold you accountable for how you used your house for his kingdom. He will, because that's his resource. He wants to see that you actually use that big house or even that small room to use it to extend his kingdom. Whenever that discipleship group comes and they sit in your house and they eat your biscuits and they... they they use your Wi-Fi and they finish it, Kwanzaa. Uh, they overflush your toilets. And that water, you know how water is precious in Nairobi. They finish your things. Come on, somebody. There's a way that you're saying, this is the master's. The master has use for his donkey. Yeah, the master wants his boats. You see that all over in scripture. The master wants his house. He wants his bundles. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Our authority in this realm is so complete that God himself will not violate it. God has given us such authority on earth that he himself will not violate that stewardship, that authority. Now, I know some of you will wonder, I mean, isn't God sovereign? Can't God do what he chooses? Doesn't the Bible say God has all power? So why, what do you mean he can't override our stewardship? But listen, when you read in the scripture, you understand something about a king. The, the law of a king is not reversible. Kings were very careful about the commands they gave because once a law was made, remember the story of Daniel? In the lion's death, then the king gives a law and then he realizes, oh my goodness, it's going to disadvantage my most important minister. I can't afford to lose this guy. But the king is helpless because he made the law and that law is binding because the law represents the king. So the king cannot be seen to be opposed to his own law. And so the king has to st step aside and let Daniel face the law. And say, may your God rescue you. He's praying now because even though he's a king, he can't intervene. Because the law stands. And God has made a law. Genesis 1.28. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule. He says, be fruitful. Increase the number. Fill the earth, subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, over every living creature. He says, you rule. So God has already given the rule. He's given the command. You're the one to rule. So God isn't going to come and rule the world on your behalf because he's already given that command. God didn't even say, let us rule. <laughs> he didn't say, let's make man in our image and let us rule with them. He said, let them rule. The planet is yours to rule. 
So God, in his sovereignty, decided to delegate authority to humankind. And humankind is basically a spirit in a body. You're really the, God has breathed his spirit into a body. Remember, we say this at some point. The body is flesh. It comes from the ground. What comes from the ground is fed by the ground and goes back to the ground. But what comes from God is sustained by God and goes back to God. And this, this is what God wants you to use to dominate. God cannot do anything on earth without the cooperation of a human being. Nothing. Like God, read the scriptures. God never acted independently. He wants to destroy the earth. These guys have become so sinful. I can't, like they are so bad. I mean, guys in Noah's time must have been really horrible. Because even till today, when people are doing such crazy things, I have not heard God saying, I want to destroy the earth yet. Like God reached a point where there was a limit to his grace. He was like, I have to destroy this planet and, st and start, start again. But guess what he does? He finds a man. He looks for a man. He says, Noah, are you ready? We need to do something. <laughs> I know a guy. <laughs> Pastor Kilonzi, you're horrible. <laughs> I know a guy. <laughs> he's like, I know this guy. And he's a righteous guy. And this guy is going to, he knows my will. He is under my, he's a guy who's following hard. The whole world is not following, but there's one, one man who is following. And God says, this one I will pour my spirit in and I will start again. God cannot do anything on earth without the cooperation of a human being. If God wants to change a really toxic office, he sends his daughter to work there. Yeah. So stop coming at 4.30 every day, praying for a new job. When your assignment is done, your king will redeploy you. Yeah. So, so yes, I think there are times, and, and to be honest, that's a hard thing, I know. But there are times when you say, Lord, this is what I desire. I desire to leave. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And in the meantime, before I leave, show me why you've put me here. Show me why you've put me here. Maybe you put me here to establish an altar. You put me here to get a few people together so we can start a prayer meeting in this place. So that God has authority in that place. Maybe you put me here so that I can start demonstrating something different to people. Maybe that's what you put me here. So show me why and help me to live well. So that by the time I'm done, I've accomplished why you put me here. And you know how we, and, and, and here's the crazy thing. God is sovereign, but he has limited his intervention on earth through us. He said, I will only act when you open the door for me to act. And the way we open the door is through prayer. So this is what prayer is. You know, sometimes we think prayer is begging God, pleading with him to do something that he really needs. Which father would create a system so his children have to beg him for something and then call himself a good father? I think we've misunderstood what prayer is. Prayer is not God putting up a barrier and saying, ask hard enough and then I'll give you. That's not what it is. Prayer is the way we grant permission to the sovereign who owns this place to act because he will not contravene his manager's authority. Wow. And that's, you know, if you're a good manager, you know that. I found myself in that position once in a while, by the way. Can I be honest? Yeah, even as a pastor, sometimes I, as a leader, I find myself in that position. Um, I like a junior employee in Mavuno or in a company that I run. And this junior employee is somebody I really love. But they're really headbutting with their head of department. And they come to me to, to rescue them and say, Pastor M, you're my father. You, you can see this is not working. Talk to that guy. Like, deal with that person or get me out of that place. And you know what I tell them? I tell them, you know, because I put that person there, they represent my authority. So let me teach you how you can honor them and help it work for you. And I pray for you. I pray, I pray you will succeed because I can't rescue you from my own manager. Because if I do that, I've just undermined my manager. And then what is this? I mean, my, if, if now people know not to respect the leaders that I've set up, I've just created anarchy. So I tell you, okay, let me tell you what Pastor James likes. Let me tell you how to honor him and respect him, 
Let me tell you what it will take for you to get in his good books. Now go and do that. That's the best I can do. Because I've set a manager. I've got a steward. And everything that happens in this compass, that's his responsibility. And for me to come and tell him, don't touch this one. This one is my child. I've actually destroyed your life. Because from then on, the whole organization, you're going to have a big target on your back. Some of you who are leaders, you know exactly what I'm saying. And so sometimes the junior staff will look at you like, you don't care for me. You're letting me suffer. And I'm like, actually, this is the best thing for you that I withdraw. I cannot intervene in that campus without Pastor James releasing me to intervene. And he knows that. But they, whenever, whenever I come to preach at Hill City, I request. I request. Now, Pastor James is a good son. So many times he'll be like, let me shift things and you come. But if he told me, Pastor M, I have a guest preacher coming. Do you mind? Let's not do that this week. I'll be like, you're the leader. You're the boss. Alain is preaching. And everybody knows he's a better preacher than you. <laughs> huh? Pastor Alain, come on. You can't interrupt Pastor Alain. Can you come the next week? I'll be like, okay, sour. <laughs> let me come the next week. Yeah, because, because I have to, my leadership represents me. Yeah? So God will not intervene on earth without a manager giving authority. And the way we managers give authority to the king is through our prayer. And that's why Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father in heaven, wow. hallowed be your name. What's the next thing? Your May your kingdom come. I remember somebody asked me another time, you know, I, I noticed I came into a few uh, prayer meetings at 4.30 and I realized people are having a confusion. The part that most people get confused is adoration. Sometimes you'll hear somebody say, okay, here's a scripture. Let's thank God for how he's given us a good week. Come on, we can adore God for, his good, for, for the good week he gave us. No, that's thanksgiving. That's very different from adoration. So people have asked me, so what is adoration? Listen to that. Hallowed be your name. That, what am I saying when I say hallowed be your name? I'm saying I am telling God how amazing he is. Not because God has forgotten, but because I often forget. So I'm saying, God, you're, the, you're in charge of my situation. You're bigger than my boss. You're bigger than my marriage right now. I bless God that I follow a God who is sovereign, that whatever pain I'm going through right now is not wasted. I worship that God. What am I saying? It's not like God is like, oh, wow, that's who I am. <laughs> that's not him. No, God is not, he's not surprised by what you're saying. But as I read the scriptures and I speak those words, I'm speaking to my spirit, up to my body. My spirit is speaking to my body and telling it, relax, God is in control. That's what adoration does. That's part one of adoration. But part two is, let your kingdom now come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the second part of adoration is me calling God's kingdom, opening the door for God to come. And what I do is because I know I'm a steward, I always say my house is the first altar. My house is the altar. So every morning when we're doing adoration, I always start with God after I adore him. Then, and, and I remind myself who he is. Then now I call the kingdom of God down in my house. I say the kingdom of God is now here. Lord, I surrender this house to you. This altar is now yours. This altar is connected to the heavenly altar. Angels are ascending and descending from this place. You have total authority over this house. My children are yours. My wife is yours. My belongings are yours. Come and take control. And I'm saying, God, I open the door. Work. And God, because he's a good leader, he waits for me to do that before he comes and starts working. Isn't that crazy? Because some of you are like, God, please come and God is like no 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 it's I want to come even more than you 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 think God loves your children more than you love them so he's not waiting for you to beg so that he can come and treat he's saying he's waiting for you to say father this child is yours may your kingdom come in his life may your will be done now Lord I release this child to you I surrender them to you do what you want wow. and that's what adoration begins to do so God wants us to open the door for him. And the way we open it is through prayer. Augustine, an early church father, once wrote, without God we cannot, without us God will not. Yeah. So without God, we are helpless. This, we cannot do. We can't change our child. We can't change our home. We can't change our financial situation. Without God, we can't. But without us, God won't. So God is waiting for us to open the door for him to come into every situation. Without our agreement and permission, God will not interfere on earth. 
Now, that's a crazy thing. That's why King David, in Psalm 8, he looks at that and he says, when I consider, he says, God, how majestic is your name in all the earth? He says, when I consider the heavens, the wax of your fingers, the moon and the stars, the things you've put in place, what is man? Like, what am I that you're mindful of me? Like, little old me, I'm the one who opens the doors for you to come in. What a shock. Like, like, who am I? I'm the one who opens the door for the king. In fact, remember the, the psalm that says, lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. I command my house, by the way, that way. I speak that over my house. I say, be, be lifted up, you doors, to this place. I say, every place I live in, by the way, I pray, for me, I pray that prayer in concentric circles. This is telling you how you even extend prayer. So that by the time those 15 minutes of adoration are finished, you're, you're not even done. And I say, Lord, I'm starting with this little compound. I live on a compound where it's my house. And then I have three other houses within our compound. So I always say, I start with, let your kingdom come here. Then I say, all my neighbors, because they're my neighbors, your kingdom is coming into their place. On my authority as their neighbor, their homes are blessed. And then I say, let your kingdom come over Hadi, the area I live in, as it is in heaven. And I dedicate that place, I surrender it. And then I say, may your kingdom come over Langata constituency. Because that's where I am. As it is in heaven, I name the person in charge of that constituency. I say, may your kingdom come over Nairobi. Why? Because I live here. And I'm a resident of this city. And I'm a representative of the kingdom of heaven. That means I have the authority to call God's power down on the kingdom of, on the city of Nairobi. And then I pray that for Kenya. And I pray that for East Africa. You understanding? I'm praying on my right as an East Africa. Let your kingdom come. Let your dominion happen today in East Africa as it is in heaven. I pray it over Africa because I'm an African. I have authority to call God to come intervene on the affairs of Africa. I pray then over all the nations of the earth because I'm a citizen of the earth as well. So what am I doing? I'm saying let your kingdom come today. All the presidents of this earth are nothing before you, Lord. And so Lord, come and be seen. And God is saying, thank you. Now I'm ready. Because you're the manager, you invite me in. Are you beginning to understand something about the power we have? Yes. Remember, we're an army, but we're saying one of the weapons of our warfare. Our warfares are not the, the, warfare, the weapons of this world, but they're, warfare, they're weapons that tear down strongholds. That's what the scripture tells us. And that's why you need to understand that you don't want to misappropriate your prayer. You don't want to misuse your prayer. It's okay to ask God for Mercedes-Benz. Amen. <laughs> it's okay. By the way, there's nothing wrong with asking God for Mercedes-Benz. And I don't, it's not a bad thing. But I want you to make sure that you don't spend the majority of your supplication asking on little things. Little things. The things that are already yours. God has already declared they're yours. So you can use your whole intercession praying for a job. Your whole intercession praying for small things. God says, if he watches the lilies, yeah, he dresses them with beauty and splendor. How much more will he clothe you? Yeah? If he feeds the sparrows, will he not also feed you? And so it's done. So use that, use even the intercession time to impose God's kingdom on earth. You know, in Jesus' culture, when you say you pray in Jesus' name, sometimes we see that as a formula. Like, I finish, then I say, in Jesus' name, amen, it's done. Because Jesus said, if you ask something in my name. But no, in Jesus, in the name of somebody meant that you understood the, the, the intent of that person. Remember the general's intent? And that you were, it was not just a label. It was not just an identifier. It means that you understood what that person was about. In other words, when I pray in Jesus' name, I'm praying in Jesus' will. I'm imposing the name and the will of my master on this earth. So how do you get to know this? Psalm 34 verse 7, it's, uh, Psalm 37 verse 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Amen. What does that mean to delight myself in the Lord? It means I get to know the general's intent. I hang out with the general. I read the word. I begin to understand what he wants. And guess what? When I know what God wants, I don't even have to pray. I just declare it. You know, as I'm reading the scriptures, it's so amazing how Jesus prays. Like he walks into a place where there's a guy who has had demons, and the demons already are the ones shouting. Ah! He's not even mentioned a word. And then they say, but you're the one who's casting us. You're casting us out. He has not even cast them out. Like Jesus could save us so much volume. So much effort and energy. If we just knew that these things are done in prayer before we showed up. Yeah. 
Jesus had already finished his prayer. When he showed up, the demons were already leaving. Before he's even had to say. Many times he just said to somebody, oh, okay, that's what you want. Your servant is now healed. Uh -huh, next. My goodness. That can save me so much volume and effort. Huh? In the name of Jesus, I pray right now. I bind right... <laughs> Demons don't fear volume. Yeah? <laughs> They fear authority. Wow. You know your identity, you know your authority. Wow. They fear your authority. In Jesus' name means I'm representing Jesus' will. You know, I've got a friend who has, we've got, we've got a friend who has a beautiful place in Mombasa. And just by virtue of their generosity to us and their love for us as a pastor, have said to us, when you need a holiday, just tell us. We'll come. In Jesus' name, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just tell us. And I mean, we're so grateful for it because many times we're tired and it's just good to have. I mean, we try not to take advantage of it, but they've said, Pasi, ask us. In fact, at the time when I just felt shy to ask, so I really looked around for money. I saved some money, took my wife. And when they had, they were so mad. They were like, why didn't you? And I was just, I was feeling shy to ask. But you know, they've said, ask, it shall be given. Just like Jesus tells us. But you know, if I was to say, I want to use that house because I want to host a political rally in your house. Or I want to use that house because I've got some guys who are plotting to overthrow the government and I want, I'm asking for your house so I can host them there so the police won't find them. Or if I was to say to them, I want to use that house so that I can use your furniture. You've got very nice furniture. As a pastor, I want to use that furniture. I sell it so I can furnish my own house. They've said, Pasi, just ask. It's yours. That's not what they meant. <laughs> Isn't it? It's obviously not. It's obvious, even though they said, ask for it. Pasi, it's yours. Ask whenever you need. That's not the part they were talking about. Yeah. Because that's not according to their will. I'm not asking according to their will. But God, Jesus says, when you ask something in my name, he's saying, when you ask something according to my will, it is as good as done. Because you understand the general's intent. And the general comes behind you and he grants your desires. John 15 verse 7. He says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Yeah? John 15 7. Just put it up there because somebody is not believing the scripture actually says you can it's a blank check ask but there's a bit of a caveat because he says this word he says if you remain in me and my words remain in you he knows that if i'm remaining in him and his word has remained in me that what i ask will be consistent with his will he knows and that's why jesus didn't have to beg he just said it and it was done because he knew the Father's will. Jesus said, there's nothing I ever do except what I've seen my Father doing in heaven. What does that mean? He knew the Master's intent. He was following hard. That's what it means by delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. It's like I hang on to God. I love him. It's like if, if I... <laughs> okay, I was going to use bad examples. Let me not use bad examples. Yeah, should I? No, maybe not. <laughs> First John 5.14. First John 5.14. Can you put that up? First John 5.14. Do you have it? Okay. Let's read that together. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. By the way, when you start to understand this, even your prayers change. Because you start... I, I told you guys, my wife taught me this. Many times you pray, God, get me out of this situation. But my wife taught me to say, God, what is your desire for this situation? Wow. It's a very different prayer. God, give me that job. God, show me if that job is for me. Very different. I am now submitting myself to his desire. I'm submitting myself to his will. And that's the confidence I have as I approach him. That if I ask anything according to his will, it's done. He's heard me. I don't have to beg. 
Ah, I mean this bad marriage. Things are not working. God, get me out of this. Uh, uh, uh. God, show me how you want me to pray for my marriage right now. Yeah, because God might be asking you to pray very different things from the ones you're praying right now. And sometimes you find for the last year, you've just been putting the same request in the supplication chat. Same one every day. I see what God is doing is maybe you're thinking, maybe he didn't see it yesterday. Let me just put the same, same request. Like, <laughs> like, 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 no, 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 no. Stop that. Just say, okay, put the request aside. God, how do you want me to pray about this situation? Show me. And that's what you, st you start to now pray according to his will, and it is done. So kingdom stewardship means God expects us to rule the earth on his behalf. We're not just ruling the earth, but we're ruling on his behalf. And one of the ways we do that is prayer. What is the king's will that we should be praying about? And that, I think, is a very important thing. That's why, by the way, when we talk about movements, one of the most important things movements do across the world, any movement I've studied, is prayer. Any movement I've studied, there's no movement, there's no global movement of churches that doesn't pray seriously. That's why I insisted we start praying together as a church. Because I looked at it and I realized there's no movement I've ever seen in the world that doesn't pray together. And so when we pray 4.30 to 5.30, the Koreans are doing that. They pray every morning. The Nigerian movements, they do that. The, the movements in Ghana, they do that. The movements in Brazil, they do that. Why? Because it's only as we pray that we begin to invite the king to do what the king wants to do. And the king did not put us on earth to establish a church. He put us on earth to establish the kingdom of God through discipleship. And so that's the first thing. The second thing then is, uh, as we move into that, as we're looking at that kingdom thing, is to ask, how do we begin to engage then in what God wants us to do? How do we begin to understand our purpose in life? You know, most people in life are looking for a certain hierarchy of needs. There's a guy called Maslow. He's a psychologist. And he put this thing called the Maslow's hierarchy. You guys have heard about it. Um, just put it up just in case some people don't understand the Maslow's hierarchy. And it, this is how most people reason, the needs for people. And those of you who've studied this in sociology or psychology, you, you get to understand that there are different levels of need for people. That people always go for the lowest level of need. And so the first level of need is your physiological needs. Food, water, warmth, rest. Those are so important. And for most people, that's where need starts. It's like, I need to get my needs met. I need someone to meet my needs in this area. Those are what you call basic needs and security, of course. Uh, if you're... If you're if, if you're in a war zone, the first thing you need is food. Because if you're starving, you'll do anything for food. But once you get your food, your water, your warmth, the next thing is shelter. I want a safe place. I'm looking for a place where my needs, I'm, I'm safe. Once you've got your basic needs met, then they say psychological needs are the next level of hierarchy, which is belongingness and love, which means friendships. Moving on to self-esteem needs, uh, which is prestige, feeling of accomplishment, and then finally, when I've got all that, then I go for self-actualization. Self-actualization means I can now buy my, my big boat and f uh, go in my friends and go on a cruise through the Mediterranean and go to Dubai to watch um, the dune races and go to the World Cup whenever the world next World Cup is with my friends. I even fly them in my own jet. Come on, somebody. Are you feeling this story? This is, this is how the natural way of thinking is first, I need, when I leave home and I'm broke and I'm 24, 24-year-olds, <laughs> uh, 20-year-olds, psychological needs, food, water, warmth, rest. I need to make sure that I'm sorted out. I can eat. Then I move to the place now of safety needs. I've got security. I've got a home. I've got a place. I can't, I'm all being kicked out. Then I move to friendships. Before you have those things, the last thing you're thinking about is friendships many times. And then I move all the way and I'm thinking the day I earn enough money, then I can do what I truly want to do. This is how the world thinks. But you know, the interesting thing is, and Miles Monroe taught this, that all cultures seek these things and all religions seek these things. All religions are built on the promise of meeting needs. And they draw in followers by promising to meet your needs, to make your life better, to improve your circumstances, to give you control over your environment. Whatever religion in the world teaches the same thing that there are certain things you can do to get a deity to give you certain things that are along this hierarchy of needs. And whether it is Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism or Judaism or Confucianism or Scientology or Baha'ism or all those other isms, 
and even many times Christianity for people who practice Christianity as a religion it's built along the same premise do you understand that Christianity was never Jesus did not come to establish a religion but there are many people who practice Christianity as a religion our religion which is Diniye to in Swahili, you know, it's our dini, it's our, it's our rights, it's the things we do to make God look after us. And we please the deity to secure these needs. I want to make sure that I please my deity because if I do the right things, if I fast enough, if I, if I, uh, if I give my money enough, if I read the Bible enough, if I do the things the pastor is telling me, then I will be given these things. This is how religion works and many times even Christians that's how they approach prayer they approach it along these things if I please or they approach their relationship with God but you know it's interesting because Matthew chapter 6 verse 25 to 30 tells us something very different and this was Jesus's approach let me just read what Jesus says to all of us who are looking for things who are looking for God so that we can have things all of us who are for us supplication is just give me give me give me here's what Jesus says he says, therefore, I tell you, can we read it together? I, I sense somebody in the house needs to hear this message very strongly today. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Just stop there right there. Come on, somebody. What? Those shoes. Because there's some people here, by the way, just give that, just make a mistake of that guy getting an extra 10K. Last scene. Huh? Kicks. <laughs> huh? Clothes. It's like, this is what I live for. And God is saying, why are you worrying about those things? What you eat or drink? Why are you worrying about the basic needs, the Maslow, the Maslow's hierarchy? Why are you being driven by those things? And he says, is not life more than food? He's like, why are you praying so much about that? I've already given you life. Don't you think life is important? <laughs> the one who you're asking has even given you life. Surely, along with those things, won't he give you more? And the, is the body more than clothes? Like seriously, God has given you already a wonderful body to put those clothes on. So relax. He's saying relax. Let's go to the next verse. Verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. Hey, we're reading together. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than them? They're not looking at their bank account. There's no bird that's going to check the ATM to see how much money it has. It doesn't go to sleep wondering whether there'll be food tomorrow. It doesn't tweet about... <laughs> <laughs> Papa Kilo. <laughs> and here's what he's asking. Are you not much more valuable than these birds? Seriously, the birds aren't worrying. Why are you worrying? Why are you worrying? And then he says in verse 27, can anyone, come on guys, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? This is a very important lesson. Some of you don't sleep well because of worry. Yeah. Some of you are so stressed. You need medicines. You're on high, hypertensive meds because of stress, because of worry. Who will look after my children? How will I make it? How will I succeed? How will I get that interview? Will I pass these exams? And that's what's driving you. But he's saying, who do you know worried so much until something changed? Like worry won't add even one hour to your life. Oh, I'm, a, I'm the provider of the house. If I don't have a job, how will my kids eat? Yes, it's true, how will they eat? But that worry will not bring food on the table. Wow. And Jesus is saying, relax, I've got this. Verse 20, 28. And why do you worry about clothes? Oh, yeah, yeah, I think it's like Jesus is handling, there's somebody being looked for in this audience. <laughs> I don't know why it keeps coming up. There's someone here who just needs to receive the word of the Lord right now. See, let's go. See. How the flowers of the field grow, they do not labor or spin. They don't hustle. That's what he's saying. They're not hustling wow. to get their clothes. Verse 29. Yet, I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. Wow. They didn't dress themselves. They were dressed. Wow. 
They were representing the king, and the king looked after them. And then he says in verse uh, 30, let's go. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is going into a fire, will he not much more clothe you? Then what does he say? You of little faith. You of little faith. Worry is lack of faith. Anytime you worry, you're lacking faith. Because he says when you worry, you have little faith. And the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because when you come to God, you must believe he exists and that he rewards. Yeah, those who diligently seek him. And so if you're worrying, it, it just shows you don't understand. Lord, if I do this for you, if I, if I take time off work to go and serve you, if I leave my job because you've asked, Lord, how will I provide? And God is saying, you have little faith. Like, is your faith in your job or is your faith in the one who gave you the job? Yeah? Yeah, I gave it to you. I can take it away. Relax. I've got you. I've got you. Verse 31. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? That person again. Or what shall we wear? 32. For, oh, come on, somebody. For who runs after this thing? The pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Oh, my God. My goodness. You know what? Pagans are not atheists. Pagans are not atheists. Pagans are extremely religious people. They are people who harness religion to get God to do things for them. There are people who fast so that God can change their situation. I mean, they, they fast to manipulate God into doing what they want God to do. That's paganism. And the pagans do these things. Pagans are consumed with survival. But Jesus is moving us to a complete shift. He's saying it's time to stop living according to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's, that, it's time to get a new set of priorities. And in verse 33, he tells us what that set of priorities is. But what? Let's, let's say it together. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. My goodness, how clear could the king have made it? The king is here. He's saying, I've put you on earth to seek my kingdom. The birds are seeking my kingdom. And because of that, I'm feeding them. The flowers are seeking my kingdom. They're displaying their purpose for which they were made. Because of that, I'm clothing even the grasses on the field. And when you seek my kingdom, guess what happens? The things that you are chasing start to chase after you. That's what God is saying. He's like, relax. I've got this. You serve me. Serve my kingdom. And watch me look after you. Jesus' words were revolutionary. He was stripping away the things we think are important. Food, drink, shelter, clothing, cars, money, luxuries, the things we live for. He's stripping those away. He's saying those are not the things that will sustain your life. And yet, these are the things that make up the majority of our prayers. 95% of our prayers, I dare say, tend to be about the things that Jesus said. Those things will come. Those things will come after. 5%, if we're lucky, tend to be the things that Jesus actually wants us to pray about. The things that are about the kingdom of God. The things he wants us to seek. And you know, God, wants, God is interested in us doing God's thing God's way. Doing God's thing God's way. Putting the kingdom first. And you know, when you do that, that's a key. That's a key to changing the world. It's a key to the kingdom economy. I tell people, I teach people about money. And I believe in teaching about money. I believe that we all should be good stewards of money. I believe that God should teach us that we need to learn from the scripture. So we learn how to save. And we learn how to destroy our debt, remove debt. Debt is an enslaver. By the way, if you're a child of this house, I really just want to say as your father, debt is not our way. This one is an instruction, by the way. God gave it to me for you. Debt is not the way we do things in this family. Don't willingly put yourself into slavery. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. So we don't want to put ourselves back into the yoke of slavery. And I challenged people a year ago, and many of you have gotten out of debt or you're on your way out of the system of this world, the enslaving system of this world. And you know what? The enslaving system in this world, right now we are heading towards a recession. 
And those who are in debt will find themselves in crisis and crazy crisis. Young people, ignore those apps. Delete those apps from your phone. That thing, it looks like a savior. It is not. It is actually a gun you're putting to your head and pulling the trigger and hoping there's no bullet in the chamber. It will blow your brains out. Run away from debt. It looks very enticing the way they market it. But it's actually not. It's there to destroy you. Betting apps, debt apps, get out of them completely. I, I teach people about saving. And one of the challenges I gave you as a church is, you know what? I want everyone in this church by the end of this year to work towards having three to six months of, empl of, of your expenses locked up somewhere where it's growing as an, as an emergency fund. And right now, how many people are on this journey right now? That's, that's, a, that's a goal that you've taken. Amen. I can see. There are soldiers in this house who are like, yes, that's the command. That's the thing God has told us. I teach people about investments because as, you, as we get into that place, we're going to start investing. By the way, there's going to be serious wealth in this church. Yeah, there will. And we're not going to bribe anybody or do any hassles or do any deals. I'm going to show you. We're going to get wealthy God's way. But you know what? Huh? The biggest resources that I have ever mastered in my life, the biggest wealth that Pastor Caro and I have right now has not come from those practices, even though they're important. I believe God wants us to be good stewards because you only trust good stewards with your resources. But the biggest wealth we have right now is because God puts divine ideas in our hands and then shows us how to execute them. And many times it's, what is that thing we're being taught? Yeah, just relax, doing, doing ministry, serving Jesus, going on missions, teaching God's word, and those things are just following after us. Yeah? So, so, so we must understand that this is how we even enter the kingdom's economy. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then ask God, be true to your word. You're the one who promised. Look after your ambassador. I need to dress good. I need to represent you well. I need to smell good. Because I'm your ambassador, I don't want to embarrass you. Show me how to do this, Lord. Let him be the one to show you. You don't have to hustle. And like everybody else, running around like a headless chicken in order that you can actually succeed in life. And that's why we need to understand the master's intent. The ultimate role of the church is through discipleship to restore the nations of the world to their rightful ruler. By the way, when we talk about praying, praying is calling God's kingdom down. It's opening the door for God to work. So even for my relatives, when I pray, I say, God, let your kingdom come down into their hearts. Speak to them. I speak on behalf of them. By the way, even when I pray for you as Mavuno, I say, Lord, I'm their pastor. I have authority to pray this over them. Let your kingdom come into their lives. Whenever I watch you on those Zoom calls, I'm always praying that your homes are... I always declare that you, every home on this Zoom call is an altar to the Most High God right now. I surrender their children. I surrender their homes. I surrender their husbands and wives. I surrender everything because I'm speaking now as your father. And I think that in the Bible, it's told me I have authority over my children. So I speak over you. And when you see your disciples, that's why it's important for you to see your DG group members there, because you have authority over their lives spiritually. To declare those same things. As a campus pastor, you have authority to declare those things in the lives over the people that God has put you responsible over. That's the authority, understanding your identity and authority. That's what prayer is. We talk about preaching. Remember the four Ps? Praying, preaching, pastoring, planting. Those are the agendas of the kingdom. That's why movements are interested in those things. Preaching is, when, is how we win people into the kingdom. We, we take the captives that the devil has taken, we take them back. Those people who are looking around us, they look like they're so rich, they look like they don't need God. They're captives. They're slaves to a dark and evil kingdom. And through preaching, my job is to bring them into the place where they understand their destiny. How many people here, if not, for, if not for God, if not for somebody bringing you to church or sharing the gospel with you, you would be lost in darkness right now? Let me just see, how many of you? Yeah, somebody cared. Somebody preached the word. Somebody invited you to a service. Somebody brought you into a small group. Somebody expanded the kingdom by catching you as a captive of hell and bringing you into the kingdom of God. And then turned you into a soldier for righteousness. And that's what we do. Whenever, you're, whenever we say that in our discipleship groups, we want every discipleship group to pray about bringing one person to Christ every week. That's what we are saying. That's the master's business. My goodness, I should be seeing in that supplication, God, our, dis our DG has not brought anyone to Christ the last three weeks. We are worried. Hey, hey. Come on. But I've never seen that prayer, by the way. 
I've seen the one for the Mercedes, but no kidding. I've seen that one. But I've never seen that one of, Lord, we're worried. Our DG has not been faithful. We have not brought anyone out of hell. Give us somebody this week. Seek first. Seek first the kingdom. What is preaching? Uh, what is pastoring? Pastoring is now taking those people we've brought out of hell, brought them into the kingdom of light, and helping them to become like Jesus. And that's when we walk with people. We share our homes. We share our food. We disciple those people. And again, my goodness, I should be using my prayers up on my discipleship group members. Lord, I want them to become like Jesus. Does this sound very weird? It's like I have one opportunity to ask 15 minutes in my prayer meeting, and I'm using 10 of those minutes to pray for the things that are really important to the kingdom of God. And then I say, oh, by the way, look after your ambassador. I also need a house and a job. Because I seek first the kingdom of God. I'm praying about the things that are on God's heart. Yes, God knows I need food. It's not that he's insensitive. But he's saying, I feed the sparrows. Don't waste all your prayers on that. Your prayers are too powerful for your pocket. I want to sustain the earth. I want to give you nations. Ask me for things that count. And then he said, we talk about planting. Planting is multiplying the kingdom of God. He's saying, Lord, I'm glad, I'm glad I'm in Lifeway Network, but Lifeway Network is too small. People are dying out there. I want my own network. Come on, somebody. Lord, I'm praying that you would take, you would take me to another country so I can extend the work that Pastor Godwin is doing. Uh, Lord, pray. Lord, raise up laborers in Lifeway who can, set, who can become missionaries. Uh, Lord, I thank you for Matrida and James that they've gone to Sagana, but more of us need to go. Come on, that's application, somebody. Let me tell you this, guys. When you start to pray prayers like that, you will start to see God work in ways you never believed possible. Lift up your eyes, guys. This is what God told me to tell you today. Lift up their eyes. Help them to stop thinking about themselves. Help them to understand the bigger picture that I have a, a world that is dying and they're the ones I've given authority over that world. Now, this is really what God wants us to do. Praying, preaching, pastoring, planting because we're ambassadors. And when you're an ambassador, you represent the government that sent you. And like I said somewhere before, the ambassador never sits down worrying about where his food will come from. He never sits down worrying. When they send you to become an ambassador to Japan, somebody, I'm not hearing amen. There's nobody here who's planning to be an ambassador somewhere. When they appoint you, when the government appoints you and says, I want you to go to Peru and represent the interests of the, the, the government of Kenya. And some of you are diplomats. I can, you look so diplomatic. Uh, that authority is going to come. By the way, this church will be full of ambassadors. Watch this space. Yeah, and you'll be sent by your different nations to represent. Guess what? There's no ambassador who, when they're appointed, they start worrying about, what about food? True story. They don't think about that. Why? Because the minute you land, even transport will have been sorted for you. All you have to do is show up at the airport. The rest is taken care of. They will feed you. They will tell you which are the best schools for your kids. They will get you the, into the best uh, club for relaxation. They will put you in the... They'll sort out your life. All you have to do is represent. Guess what, people? You're ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven. And that's why Jesus is saying, stop worrying about little things. You're spending your whole time worrying about little things. I want you to worry about the things that I've given you responsibility over. Calling down the kingdom of heaven into earth. We're driven by our quest for things and a good life. But God is looking for kingdom-driven people. Kingdom-driven people. The happiest Christians are kingdom-driven Christians. Yeah, because they don't walk around fearing. They don't walk around worried. But what about me? Who will look after me? They know that they are looked after. Am I speaking to somebody in the house? Are you guys asleep? Should I, should I stop? The guys on this side, you guys look like you've had enough of the retreat. Yeah? Are you, are you there? You're still with me? Guys, God wants to send you. He wants you to represent Him. The most amazing kingdom that ever existed. The nations are ready for you. Okay, these guys aren't ready. The nations are ready for you. Yes, somebody's a witness in this house. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The guys in the middle, the nations are ready for you. Yes, they are. They are. So don't, don't, don't sit back and just be a safe Christian. This is why, guys, we must understand this thing about following. That's why we must understand it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters. You can't serve your job and God at the same time. No one can serve two masters. 
Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money, God's people. You can't. You can't. You can't serve God and money. And there are too many Christians today who are captives to mammon. Their whole life is structured around looking for money. And God is saying, how do you do that? How do you waste the authority that I've given you looking for little things like those? In heaven, the streets are made of gold. By the way, gold doesn't depreciate. It's even better money than shillings or dollars. Yeah. It's, it's the ultimate currency. And guess what in heaven it's used for? <laughs> it's cabro. It's a pavement. It's a thing you walk on. And you're spending your whole life looking for the thing you're going to be walking on. Yeah? Come on, guys. God has much more for us. Lift up your head, God's people. There's a bigger life to live. There are bigger things to aspire for. God wants us to live for godly things, for kingdom things. Yeah. Come on. Let's not get content with mediocrity. Let's not settle for less. Don't settle for less. Can you hear Father's heart here? Don't settle for less. God wants you to aspire for kingdom-sized things. God demands your heart, your undivided loyalty. And in this season, God wants us to learn to follow. He wants us to become sons and daughters who are aligned to his kingdom. Every kingdom has authority structures. Every kingdom, it cannot, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. You cannot be in Mavuno Kampala, but you've got an agenda that is different from Pastor Mike's agenda. You can't, unless you're representing another kingdom. In which case, what we need to do with you is bind you and cast you out. Because yeah. Yeah. that's what we do. We, we use the weapons of our warfare and we bind and we cast out. If you're there, you're there to serve one agenda, the king's agenda, and the king has appointed his, his leader. And so I fall in line behind that leader and I follow because I understand that that is what is equipping me to do the thing that I came on earth to do, which is to represent the kingdom of heaven on earth. And my goodness, may we get to heaven one day and find that there are people waiting for us. There's a cheering squad waiting for us. There are people who I brought to Christ. There are people who I discipled. There are nations that were changed because I preached the word. Let me tell you people, there's nothing better than living for the kingdom of God. I meet people who come and tell me stories about how their lives were changed because I preached to them. Just one person, by the way, let me just say, one person you bring to Christ changes the lives of thousands. I had the privilege of bringing this daughter here, being one of the people who influenced her to come to Christ. My goodness, she has influenced so, so many people. Greater influence in many ways than I have. But can you imagine, every time she's influencing, I'm back there saying, come on, come on somebody. Yeah, 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 God use me. You know, even if I did nothing else good in life, there's Pastor Angie. Yeah, there's Pastor Angie. She's living for the kingdom. She's making a difference. And I'm so, so proud of her. And that's what counts. That's what counts. When I get to heaven, by the way, those are my crowns. That's what the Bible says. The jewels I will have. The real capacity I'll have in heaven is people like these. The people I've poured my life into. The people who have become something on earth because I was there. Come on, guys. Don't put your treasure on things that rust, where rust destroys, where moth destroys and rust destroys it. Put your treasure in heaven where nothing can destroy it. And the only treasure you can put in heaven is people's lives. It's people's lives. And so today, that's what I think God wanted us to comprehend. That He wants us to live for something bigger. Tell your neighbor, you have to live for something bigger. God wants you to live an, an undivided life. A life of absolute loyalty to Him. Matthew 16, verse 24 to 27. I want to pray for us. Then Jesus said to His disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must, must, not a should, must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Come on, the person who wants clothes. If all you're looking for is, all you're living for is, your priorities are around increasing your wardrobe, having a nicer house, 
having security. He says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Oh, come on. I'm praying. I'm so glad that there's some young people in the house today. I'm glad there's some teenagers in this house today. Because this is the best thing you can ever do with your life. Don't let anyone cheat you. I'm so glad I started serving God when I was young. God arrested me before I went into the world to waste my life. And I've been able to live for the thing that counts. And let me tell you, nothing compares with it. And all those other things that people are chasing, they have still come after me. They have still followed me. I'm not poor. <laughs> I'm not. The Lord has looked after me. Sometimes He's looked after me without money. Pastor Carol can tell you, there are times we have no money in our account and yet God has just brought ravens like Elijah, people to feed us. And we've eaten better than the people who have money. There are times God has taken us on a holiday when we have zero money in our account and we've had a better holiday than people who have a lot of money in their account. Because He watches over the sparrow. He watches over us. And so He says to us, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet lose their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels and He will reward each person according to what they have done. This is what we're living for God, God's people. That God wants us to live one life, one focus, living for the kingdom. Yes, I know you work for Safaricom. I know you work for Airtel. I know you work for that amazing corporation. Ah, don't let that be your source of security. Your biggest source of security is that you represent the greatest kingdom that ever existed and that will ever exist. That's who you are. That's what your identity is. Your identity is not manager in heaven. Your identity is not CEO in heaven. Your identity is not an uh, uh, act actuarial scientist. That doesn't impress any angels. Oh my goodness, the one thing that the angels are impressed in is that you're a son or a daughter of the living king and you understand your assignment. That's who you are. Yeah, Daniel, the angels say to him, the minute you began to pray, I was assigned to you. Yeah, that's what God wants you to be. Daniel was not assigned an angel because he was a high official in the government. He was assigned an angel because he was a son of God who understand, he understood his kingdom authority. And God wants us as the people of Mavuno to understand our kingdom authority. And so my prayer now is, having heard this, my goodness, there will be no more people who are saying, look, I'm not sure if I want to follow. I'm not sure if I want to just live my life for myself. Your life is too important for you to waste it on yourself. God has bigger things He wants you to live for. He wants you to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. I want to pray for us. I'm ready to pray now. Anybody ready for prayer? <laughs> yeah. Let me just ask all the discipleship group leaders to stand. Anybody leading a discipleship group right now? You've got a group that you're discipling. You could be a campus pastor even. You could be a movement leader, but you're discipling a group. You've got your household. You've got people that are your spiritual sons and daughters that you're discipling right now. Any one of you who's in that category, Pastor Kara, you need to stand. Any one of you who's in that category, Pastor Faith, I need you standing because you're those people. Pastor Angie, you've got your children. You're leading your children. They're people that you're raising up for the kingdom. They're people that you're discipling. Bless the Lord for you. Let's just appreciate these disciples. To God be the glory. I thank God for you. Amen. Amen. I want to bless you. I want to bless you, our disciple leaders. Some of you are zonal pastors. Some of you are campus pastors. Some of you are DG leaders or MC leaders. You're part of that array, that war array. You're part of the battle formation for this kingdom, the kingdom of God. And I bless God for you. My encouragement to you even as I pray for you, seek first the kingdom, guys. Those people God has given to you, it's not just another, another task. This could be the most important assignment you ever carry out on earth. That group you're leading right now could be the reason God allowed you to be on this earth. Could be the reason you were born. Yeah, it could be. It could be the most important thing you've ever done or will ever do. Pouring your life into those people. The people you're pouring your life into are people who you, you never know. You could be pouring your life into the next president of your country. You could be pouring your life into the person who will become the next Billy Graham. 
the next person who will bring thousands upon thousands of people to Christ. You could be pouring your life into somebody who will be way greater than yourself and you'll have the privilege of saying, ah, this one is mine. This is my crown. So whatever issues that you're facing with them, be a parent. Just like you would with your own biological children, look after them, care for them. Jesus' words to you are, if you love me, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Don't make it a secondary thing. Don't make it another thing you do in addition to your work. This is it. If you love me, feed my sheep. Father, I just want to thank you for these amazing leaders, these shepherds that you've raised over your people. And I want to pray for them, Lord, that you will expand their capacity, that, Lord, you'll expand their hearts, that they will be good fathers and good mothers because they represent the best father of all. They represent the good father of heaven. I pray that, Father God, you would give them such a love, such a love for the people they're discipling. I pray that, Lord, you'd show them how to bring out the kingdom of God in these ones, to raise them up, because discipleship in many ways is just parenting. It's spiritual parenting. Give them the concern for their people's welfare. Help them to use a lot of their prayer space praying for those disciples. Help them, Lord, to seek first your kingdom and its righteousness in the people you're giving them that all other things will be added to them. And Lord, I'm praying that, Lord, you would, they would flourish. As they look after your children, may they flourish. As they seek first your kingdom, may they flourish. Lord, as they give out to others, may they never be left empty. May their homes always be amply supplied. May they see how you watch over the sparrows. May they testify, the Lord watches over my family. And so I bless you, God's leaders. Heaven smiles at you today because you're obedient to what God is asking you to do. Mark my words, you will be grateful that you did it. When I look at Pastor James, I'm grateful that I was faithful. When I look at Pastor Angie, I'm grateful that I was faithful. When I look at Pastor Godwin, Pastor Faith, I'm grateful that we were faithful and that we are being faithful. There's nothing more important we'll ever do. By the way, when we die, you're it. Yeah, you're it. The investment of our lives. You have people that God wants you to raise. That you're able to say, these are my crown in glory. And Father God, I pray for each of these that when they enter heaven's gates, there will be such a joy and a celebration. There will be such a crown waiting for them because of the people that they have raised. I'm going to invite everybody else to stand. In fact, let me ask those who are standing to sit and let me invite the rest to stand because I want to bless you as well. So, sons and daughters who are standing, I need you to understand this, that the command of Jesus, the very last command he gave us is go and make disciples of all nations. He didn't say, when you're old enough, make disciples. He didn't say when you have a good job, when you have a big house, he said, make disciples. And so my prayer over you is that God will tag the people to you that he has for you. Remember, we said your disciples are tagged to you spiritually. So my prayer for you is that God will tag those spiritual children he has for you and actually open your eyes to see them. And that you will have the joy of being obedient to your master's command as you raise up fearsome, powerful generals for the kingdom. And that that will be something that the Lord will give you joy to do this year. None of you who's standing is exempt from Jesus' command. And my prayer is you will not say, God, let me wait until next year. You will say, I want to do it now. I want to obey the master now. I want to be faithful now. And so, Father God, I thank you for your sons and daughters. They're amazingly gifted. They're so beautiful to you, Lord. You made them in your image. You desire that, Lord, everything you have for them will come true in their lives. And Lord Jesus, I pray that they will seek your kingdom and your righteousness, that, Lord, you would bring disciples to them because your intent for them on earth is that they will make disciples of nations. Father, I pray tag sons and daughters to each of these ones so that, Lord, they will be able to use their resources to, to raise up a generation of generals. I pray that you would give them global, international impact because of the way you will bless them. They will bless sons and daughters who will do even greater things than them. 
Lord, the skills you've given to them, I pray that you'd show them how to multiply those skills in others. And I pray that, Lord, your kingdom will advance through these ones. And Lord, at the next gathering, when I pray for discipleship group leaders, I'm looking forward to praying for these ones as well. And saying, my goodness, look at what God has done. Yeah, I thank you because you're going to do it. And Lord, I thank you that each of them is actually gifted already for that work. Because we don't have to be smart, we just have to follow. <laughs> we just have to teach what we're being taught. And so I just speak over you. May the Lord just do this for you. And as he does that, and as you seek his kingdom, may all other things be added to you. All the things that you spend time praying, may you see them following you as opposed to you following them as you seek first the kingdom of God. And I speak blessing over your household, blessing over your, your even the things that you desire. You will see God doing those things. But even more, giving you the things he desires for you. May you live to see those things. In fact, I speak over you that you will teach other people the thing I'm teaching right now. It will be your joy to teach other people to be kingdom stewards. And so I bless you now. I'm so proud of you. May the Lord just open doors for you that no one can shut. Ah, may you be an ally. May your campus pastor say, I'm thankful for this one. What a faithful steward. What a faithful soldier in this army. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's just appreciate them. Wow. Wow. Amen. The anointing in this house is an anointing of leadership. It's an anointing of leadership. I know it sounds radical to say, to say in one breath, to say follow hard. And then to say we have an anointing of leadership. But remember the thing we said, you'll never be a good leader if you can't be a good follower. And so when I say follow hard, it's because the anointing in this house is an anointing of leadership. And God wants us to make disciples of all nations. This is the smallest we'll ever be. Yeah. God is doing something. He's there's a rumbling happening. There's something powerful that God is doing. Our sons and daughters are aligning. My goodness, you're going to see joy like you've never seen before. You're going to see God doing things in our lives like never, we've never seen before. And you know what? Remember when the disciples came and rejoiced and they said to, to Jesus, we saw demons fleeing. We saw demons falling down from heaven. We saw people being healed. You will see those things. You will see those things. By the way, you will see them. Like I said, by the end of this year, you will not recognize yourself in some of the things you will be doing. But here's the thing that Jesus said to them. He said, that's fantastic. But here's the most important thing. Rejoice that your name is written in the book of life. Rejoice that your name is in that army, that you're representing the kingdom of heaven, that what you have cannot be taken away from you, that the world did not give you the joy you have, the world can't take it away. Rejoice because you're representing the king of kings. I hope this has been helpful for somebody. I hope now your mind has opened, you can see it. You can see it. So guess what we're doing this afternoon? We're praying for impartation. This is what I love doing this. We're going to be praying for blessing, praying for impartation. We're going to have some time to worship and then we're just going to spend time praying. Ah, my goodness. Today I'm going to, I just feel like I need to pray for people to get married. I just have that. Yes. The Holy Spirit is here. We're going to ask Him. But remember, 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 remember. This is not a spouse to make you happy. This is a spouse to help you serve God. <laughs> So as we ask for those things, we are asking for a different motive. We're not just saying, I need a man or I need a woman. You're saying, Lord, I need a helper to help me do your work. And as you seek first the kingdom, I bet you today you're going to see the kingdom of God coming down. All things being added unto us. So enjoy your lunch. Come ready for impartation. God bless you.